going to look at this again uh, later on in a little bit more detail. Uh, but we've got one last fundamental function that we do want to go ahead and analyze, and that is the exponential function. And uh, the basic exponential function, e to the x. Uh, the question is, well, it's not a question because I told you. Here it is. This is the derivative. The derivative of the exponential function is itself. <coughs> That's very special. Very, very special. Because the only, besides the zero function, right, besides the constant function zero, the exponential function is the only function that is its own derivative. And so I want to prove this. Let's prove by definition why the um, exponential function is its own derivative. So I'm using the definition, the one we used on the test, right? The derivative of e to the x uh, by the formula, uh, again, just to remind ourselves what this formula is. So there's the formula, and in this case, I'm going to let f of x be the exponential function e to the x. Okay, so what is f of x plus h? We always do. Whenever we see an x, we replace it with x plus h. So that would be e to the x plus h. That's f of x plus h. And then I subtract e to the x, and all of this is over h. Uh, and now things, uh, now things come to a standstill. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what I'm supposed to be doing now. Um, we don't, you know, we've talked about different uh, function forms and how they're treated through this limit. Power functions are done through factoring. Uh, radical forms are done through uh, con conjugates. Uh, reciprocal forms are done by identifying the least common denominator uh, or clearing compound fractions, however you want to look at it. <coughs> what happens here? How do we actually perform the necessary rearrangement that we need uh, for this indeterminate form? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and factor out, uh, in fact, well, first of all, let me go ahead and make it clear. Um, the uh, exponent x plus h in that initial term, that's the result of our addition rule, right? X plus H comes from multiplying e to the X times e to the H. That's the way we simplify expressions that involve a common base. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, separate those now. And once I've done that, I can identify a common factor. Right now, e to the X is a common factor now that I've rewritten the original uh, front term in terms of that product. So the next step is to go ahead and factor that out. So I'm going to take the e to the x out, pull it out front. What do I have left? Okay. Now, this new factor e to the x that I just pulled out, it doesn't involve the limit with respect to h. It's constant. So this guy can be moved out front without any you know, uh, limits pass through products. And since H isn't part of this factor's expression, it really doesn't enter into the process of the limit. So I can go ahead and pull this guy out. And in the end, the only thing that I'm really trying to determine is what is this equal to? What is the limit as of E to the H minus 1 over h as h approaches zero. Uh, so this is where it all comes down. It all comes down to this. If I can evaluate this limit, then I can solve this problem. Um, now we don't have a direct algebraic method for solving this problem, but we could do this by table of values, like we did on the quiz. So here's an example of a problem where I would probably institute some table of value to determine the value of this limit. Um, I don't think I did it here in advance. Uh, I guess I could post that. Uh, but I'll tell you what happens. Uh, if we let h approach zero in the usual way, you know, pick a sequence of points, point 0.1, point 0.01, point 0.001 coming in from the left, negative point 0.1, negative point 0.01, negative point 0.001 coming in. Oh, that's from the left, the other one's from the right. What am I going to see? Well, turns out this limit is equal to 1. 
And so once the limit has been evaluated, all I have left is that factor of E to the X that I just got through removed. Um, so I do want you to verify that, right? Um, I'll go ahead, when I post the notes, I might put that table in, or I might just ask you to do it on a test or a quiz. But that's an important idea, right? And there's an example of why we need that tabular method avail uh, to have that available to us. Uh, otherwise, I'm not sure how I would have determined what that limit was, uh, what was happening there. Um, I don't know, there might be some geometric method, I'm not sure. But tabularly, I can establish that. Now I've proven it. As long as that limit actually equals one, then the derivative of the exponential function is itself. Oh, I lost my notes. I don't know where they went, so I'm going to have to remember how this goes. Uh, well, first of all, let's do this. Let's just do the usual thing. Uh, what's the nth derivative? And this should be an obvious question. What's the nth derivative? What's it going to be? E the X. <coughs> Every time I take the derivative, uh, you know, starting from the original, starting from F of X equals E to the X. Every time I take a derivative, I get the same thing. It never changes. Since it's its own derivative, every time I take a derivative, I'll get the same thing. So there's no guessing. I know exactly. No matter how, times, how many times I do this, I'm always going to get the same thing. So here's a new form of behavior of repeated de de derivatives being applied. We saw power functions when the integer is positive. Uh, when the power is a positive integer, we saw how they behave when the uh, power is a negative integer. We looked at sine and cosine and how they cycle through themselves. We saw a secant function. Was it the secant function that we did? Man, I can't remember now. Uh, but uh, here's the uh, e to the x. Never changes. Always the same. No matter how many times I do it, get e to the x back. No problem. Um, okay, so good. That's fine. Uh, let's see. Where are my notes? I don't know where they went. Here? No, that's not it. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe they're here. Oh well, okay, I just have to recreate them. Okay, uh, so let's do this. Uh, again, here's a U. In fact, we just got through doing this with respect to the um, trig function. Uh, let's find the derivative of, uh, of this, f of x. Uh, let's do this one. Okay, we did this for the trig function, so let's do it for the exponential function. I should see a similar sort of behavior here. Uh, let's see. Um, so, what rule am I going to use? So, I need to split this up into its uh, product components. So, I guess I'll call this function here u, and I'll call this function here v. So, what is the derivative of u going to be equal to? And the derivative of v, and so that's easy. <coughs> and so what is the derivative of this function? And now, back to the usual routine, uh, the derivative of the first factor function, which we just determined to be 2x, multiplied by the original second factor function, e to the x. And then I'm going to add the original first factor function multiplied by the derivative of the second. And since the function and its derivative are the same, I've got that common factor. So there's the result of differentiation. But again, let's go ahead and make a habit of it. Uh, if I produce multiple terms, let's go ahead and factor out the common factor. What's the common factor between these two terms? And what do I have left? 
to and front, x and back. And this is always the case for the exponential functions because of the fact that whenever I apply a product rule to some combination of exponential forms, I always re recover the original expression. So always factor uh, these expressions according to the common factor whenever we have uh, issues of, of this nature. Um, Uh, let me think, uh, well, what was the other one? I just saw it. Uh, yeah, let's do this problem. Yeah, let's do this problem. Again, always doing uh, the usual sorts of things. Um, so, what's the equation of the tangent line to uh, this curve? Go ahead and do that. Why not? Okay, so what comes first? Derivative. So here's my function y. Anytime I see tangent line as part of the problem, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to find the derivative. What's the derivative of this function? Okay, that was easy. And now, how do I find the slope of the tangent line? So we're doing this evaluation, x equals zero. So I'm going to plug the um, point of tangency, x coordinate, into the formula. To the zero is or two times zero is zero. Uh, what is e to the zero equal to? One. Just like anything, anything to zero is one. Uh, so the slope is negative two. Okay. So and and to ask for the equation, yeah, the equation. Well, that's the easy part. Uh, so the equation. So the equation is going to be uh, what? Uh, y minus negative 2, negative 2, x minus 0. So y plus 2, negative 2x. Two so there's the equation of the tangent line. All right, usual thing. Um, okay, that's good. And let's see, one more example. Yeah, uh, no, the, yeah, I got two more examples I want to do. Let's do this. So, the, so finding the slope of the tangent line, that's one thing. Uh, and the other case uh, that we've been looking at all along, uh, horizontal tangent lines. So where does, uh, well, just, let's just ask the question about the basic graph. Y equals e to the x. Where does this graph have horizontal tangent lines? What do I do? This is a question about tangents, so I've got to have the derivative. Okay. I'm looking for horizontal tangent lines, so now what do I do? Horizontal tangents have a slope of zero, the derivative represents the slope. So the tangent lines will be horizontal whenever the derivative is equal to zero. What are the solutions to this equation? For what values of x is e the x going to be equal to zero? No. E to the zero is one. So what are you going to say? Impossible. It's impossible that the any positive number raised to any power could be zero or negative. So this equation has no solutions, which means 
that the graph has no horizontal tangent lines. And of course, uh, you know, uh, so what that means is this graph can never change directions. We already knew that. We know what the graph of this thing looks like. Right? We saw that back in pre-calculus one. I know what this graph looks like. It's always increasing, right? As I move leftwards, it becomes uh, smaller. As I move rightwards, it becomes larger. So I really didn't need to uh, solve that problem through uh, trichalculus. I already knew it. I already knew that graph didn't have any horizontal tangents. There's a verification. Um, the fact that this equation has no solutions follows from the result itself, right? It kind of almost begs the question. If this function had a solution, then it would be an entirely different function. Okay, well that function doesn't have any horizontal tangent lines. What about this one? So that's the same question about this function. Now that we've got it. Uh, we've just, uh, in fact, let's go ahead and, um, yeah, let's just do it here. Let's find the horizontal tangent lines of this function. Huh? So what do I do? Okay. Now I can see why that factorization method is so important. Now that I've already got this thing factored, where are the solutions going to be? Each fa in order for this product to be equal to zero, the factors themselves must be zero, so one possible outcome is here. If x itself is zero, that's a solution. The second possibility is here, whenever e of the x is zero, that'll be a solution, but we just showed this is impossible, so I don't get anything out of that. And finally, this last factor, if it turns out to be equal to zero, then that would be another potential turning point. Uh, well, I guess I'll do it, do it this way. Uh, and so uh, this is one reason why uh, whenever we apply this product rule to the transcendental functions, the transcendentals are the exponential function, the trigonometric functions, whenever we apply the product rule to those types of functions, we always factor because we're anticipating this sort of an operation. Uh, if I'm trying to solve this equation in order to locate the horizontal tangents, I'm setting it to zero in order to solve an equation based on uh, the zero product rule, I need that factorization to be part of the uh, component. So. There's the result. This graph has two horizontal tangent lines. One of them occurs at zero, and the other one occurs at x equals negative two. So that's a clue to what this graph might look like. Doesn't solve all the issues with this graph, but now I know something about it. Two potential turning points. One at the origin, uh, or yeah, one at the origin, one at where x is negative two. Um, so in about a month or so, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to actually graph this by hand by making this identification and a few others. Okay, well, I don't know where my notes went. I'll, these will look a lot neater when I post them, but uh, there, uh, that's our last. So, uh, we took care of the trigonometric functions and finally our exponential function. There's still one left over, though. We've still got one fundamental uh, algebraic function that we haven't treated. Logarithm. We had not logarithm yet. So uh, I think we're going to do that next week, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there you go. Everything in the homework is ready to go. So when we come back in on uh, Monday, we'll have our next quiz, and then we'll move on to the next thing. So. Okay. Have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you next time.